All right, Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Amen. Powerful words from the Apostle Paul. These are some of the most profound statements in all the New Testament. And today I want to share with you on this topic, the blessings that come through the blood. The blessings that come through the blood. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and help us this morning as we look into God's word together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the beautiful name of Jesus, and we thank you this morning for the gift of your word. It is the lamp for our feet, and it is the light for our pathway. Jesus, you said that the word of God is like seed, so we ask that you would touch our hearts right now in these next few minutes. Would you let our hearts be good soil, soil that can receive and hold on to and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God? Lord Jesus, you said your words are spirit and they are life. So would you send your spirit now and minister life to us from the word? If you agree with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen? We've been working our way through Paul's letter to the Romans, and we've been looking at his defense and explanation of the gospel. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul is talking about the greatest need that men and women have. Paul demonstrated in those chapters that all people, no matter what their background, have been separated from God by sin. Because of that separation, our great need is to be justified. In other words, we need to be forgiven of sin and then declared righteous by God. I need God to treat me just as if I'd never sinned. We've gone astray from God, and so we need to be put back in right standing with him. And church, this is the greatest need of the human race. Paul says in chapter 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is the who of the gospel. In other words, who are the people who need to be justified through Jesus Christ? And the answer is everyone. The good news of the gospel is that God has made a way for all of us to be justified and receive a new status with God. Every one of us can become a part of his family. So that's the who of the gospel. Then moving on into chapter 4, we saw Paul talking about the how of the gospel. How exactly can people be justified? Paul explains that people cannot be justified because of their ancestry or their religious background, nor can they become righteous by doing good deeds. He says that we are justified by faith, faith in the God who is willing to justify the ungodly, the God who is willing to show mercy to the undeserving. We are justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, you know when Jesus died on the cross, he was bearing the punishment for your sins and mine. 
And if we have faith in Christ and if we trust in him as the only sacrifice that takes away our sins, God says he will not only pardon us, but he will also count us as righteous. He will give us that new status. He won't credit sin to my account, but instead he will credit to my account a righteousness that I never earned and that I never could have earned. If you were with us there in chapter 4, then you remember how we talked about Abraham and how it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And that's the how of the gospel. Today, as we turn the corner into Romans 5, we see that Paul is revealing to us a major turning point in this letter. Up until now, Paul's been debating with people who, for a variety of reasons, were opposed to the gospel message. And so that's why Paul was showing them who needs to be justified by Christ and how. But as we come into chapter 5, which begins with that word, therefore, you will notice a change. Paul is now going to shift his focus away from the enemies of the gospel, at least a little bit, and he is shifting his teaching emphasis away from the who and the how. Now he's going to be speaking directly to believers in Christ. He's speaking to you and me. And over the next few chapters, Paul is going to be exploring with us the what of the gospel. Paul is now going to be thinking about some completely different questions. Questions like, what are the blessings that come to those who have been justified by faith in Christ? What are the riches that belong to us because we have a new status as friends of God and children of God? And what is the difference that being justified will make in my life, both today and in the future? In chapter 5 all the way up through chapter 8, Paul is going to uncover for us the blessings that we've received because of the blood of Jesus Christ. How does the reality of Christ's salvation break into my life? Now that I'm justified and I belong to God, how do Christ and his spirit help me? How does Jesus prepare me for the age to come? And Paul begins to lay all of this out for us in chapter 5. So if it helps, you can think of my message today as really an introduction to a new section of Romans. But inside this portion of scripture that we've read this morning, I find that there are three great blessings that belong to us now that we've been justified. Three great blessings that come to us through the blood, and I want to share them with you. The first one is this. Because of his blood, we have peace with God. Because of his blood, we have peace with God. With God. Paul says in verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's an old joke that says, when you see a therefore, you need to stop and figure out what it's there for. And this is one of the greatest therefores in the entire Bible. And so we ought to stop and think about why it's here. This particular, therefore, is the glorious conclusion that Paul is drawing from everything that he's said in Romans up to this point, and especially in chapter 4. I'm going to give you some free Bible reading advice today. You know, churches, sometimes we need to ignore the chapter and verse divisions that are in your Bible. In case you didn't know, those numbers are not really part of the text. They were added on centuries later in order to help us study the scriptures. In order to understand the word of God better, sometimes we need to remember that chapter breaks can be awkward. And they can, you know, interrupt the writer's train of thought. This particular chapter break between Romans 4 and Romans 5, unfortunately, is actually one of the worst chapter breaks in the entire Bible. It's true. Bearing that in mind, let's look for a moment at Paul's teaching and let's think it through without that artificial break confusing us. Starting at the end of chapter 4 and then flowing straight on into chapter 5, listen, Paul is saying this, righteousness will be credited to us 
If we believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a lot better, isn't it? Therefore, because of our believing in him and being raised to life, God has justified us. God has made us righteous. And the effect of that, the result of that, Paul says, is now we have peace with God. Praise God. Now we have peace with God. You know, back in chapter 3, Paul gave us a really terrible laundry list in which he was setting out in great detail the terrible spiritual condition of wicked people. Maybe you remember that that was one scary passage that somehow Pastor Glenn forgot to have me preach. <laughs> and there in chapter 3 where Paul was describing the wicked, listen, he said, the way of peace they have not known. Talking about the wicked, he said, the way of peace they have not known. And church, what a true word that is. Before we were justified, we were just like that. We were strangers to the way of peace. This is the first blessing, the most necessary blessing for all of us to receive. Without it, everything else is meaningless. We need to be at peace with God. It's our most critical spiritual need because once God declares us to be righteous by faith, then our separation from him, our state of war with him comes to an end. Before we come to Christ, you know that some of us, some people are indifferent to God. Maybe you know some people that are indifferent to God. On the other hand, there are some folks who have opposed God rather forcefully, right? And maybe you've known a few people like that also. But church, can I tell you that none of us, by nature, is born God's friend. Sounds a little rough to say, I know, but in a very real way, every single one of us was born an enemy to God and a stranger to his holiness. Many times... When we share the good news of the gospel with people, the greatest hurdle that we have to jump over with folks is helping them to understand, listen, that by nature, we have no claim to a seat at God's table. It's only by God's grace that we can be there. The good news is really great news, precisely because the bad news about our spiritual condition really is just that bad. Without Jesus, we are lost. And it's quite true that no matter how politically incorrect it may be to say it this way nowadays, we are the enemies of God. In our reading today, Paul tells us in four different ways exactly what our true condition is apart from the blood of Christ. He gives us four good reasons why none of us can experience peace with God apart from Jesus Christ. First, in verse 6, Paul says that when Christ died for us, we were without strength. We had no ability to save ourselves, no ability to put ourselves back into right standing with God. We could never change ourselves into a people who by nature were at peace with God. Paul then says that Jesus died for us when we were ungodly. That's a strong word. And it means that we're a people who by nature have no reverence for God. You know, before we met Jesus, we didn't truly care about God or what he said. The fact that we were not at peace with God might not even really have bothered us so much. Then Paul says, we were sinners. Now, that's another strong word. Obviously, this word does not mean, in Greek, it does not mean that you just stumbled into sin. There is nothing about this word that says, oops. On the contrary, this word means that we were people that were devoted to sin. We enjoyed our sin. Church, be amazed here at the love of God in Christ. The Holy Spirit is telling us that even while we were devoted to our sin, even when we were in love with our sin, Christ died for us. And this is how God demonstrates his love towards us. Finally, Paul says, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son when we were 
enemies. And that word means we were not neutral about the idea of God. You know, I could take God or I could leave him. No, it means we were actively opposed to him. We were actually glad to be working against him. In fact, the Greek word for enemies here, it comes directly from their word for hatred. Now, I need to be careful here because I don't want to be in the position of misrepresenting the Lord in any way. And we need to understand, church, that because of what Jesus has done for us, all of the strain in the relationship, all of the enmity between God and man can be found on one side, and that's on our side. See, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his son. And Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. God is not our enemy. But in our rebellion, we have turned to become his enemy. Who were we before we were justified? And what were we like? We were weak people rejecting God, enjoying our sin, and working against him. And yet, even in that condition, his great love compelled him to touch our hearts. He gave us the gift of faith so we could reach out to him. We trusted in the blood of his son. We trusted in Christ's sacrifice instead of trusting in our own good works to save us. And friends, when that happened, you and I were justified. He declared us to be righteous. And when he did that, that state of war between God and me came to an end. Praise God. So what is this peace that I've gained through Jesus' blood? Is this the peace that we talk about and sing about that passes understanding? Is this the peace in my heart that carries me, you know, carries me through the storms of life? No. This is not that kind of peace. This is not the quiet assurance that we look for in tough situations. This is not peace from God. This is peace with God. It's peace concerning my relationship with God. It's peace concerning where I stand with him. It's peace about the fact that God has really accepted me. It's peace about the fact that if I were to see him face to face right now, and even if I should be called home to the Lord today, I know that my sin is no longer a barrier to me enjoying his presence forever. This peace is the removal of anxiety about my spiritual condition because I know that he no longer sees me as an enemy, but as his child and even as a friend. It's a vital question that every one of us needs to ask. When I think of God, do I still see him as stern and cold and distant can I only imagine the Father looking at me through narrow, disapproving eyes? Or do I know that because I've been justified, I have peace with God? Do I know that I'm in good standing with him? You know, there's an old hymn that says, nothing between my soul and the Savior. And it's only when we've been justified by faith that that becomes my experience. The nagging fear that God will cast me away. He replaces that fear with his peace and he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love and I have drawn you to myself with cords of loving kindness. He says, don't be afraid, but draw near to me and I will draw near to you. I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And then church, the Holy Spirit within you cries out and says, Abba, Father. And then you have the witness in your own spirit that you have become a child of God. You know, once... We were afraid that his hands would push us away. And then with just a small measure of faith, we started to walk closer to him. And as we did, we saw that his hands were carrying wounds of love. We walked a little closer toward him. And there we found ourselves 
in the embrace of his arms. No longer a stranger, no longer an enemy, but now a father and a friend. You may not know him that way yet, but you can. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Three great blessings that come to us through the blood. The first one is peace with God. The second one is this. Because of his blood, we have access to the grace of God. Because of his blood, we have access to the grace of God. Beginning in verse 2, Paul says that through Jesus, we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Salvation by grace through faith is something that we saw in Galatians. We've seen it here in Romans as well. We're going to see it also in Paul's letter to the Ephesians when we arrive there in the year 2025, give or take. So stick around. That's going to be great. Being justified by faith means that we have been saved through the sheer unmerited kindness of God. And we receive it by faith as a gift without adding anything to it along the way. But is that all that Paul is referring to here in Romans 5? Is Paul talking here only about saving grace? No. This is more than just the grace that first brings us into a relationship with God. It's much more than that. Paul says it is the grace in which we stand. In other words, it's the grace in which you and I are living right now, every day. Through the grace of God, I'm not only saved, but I now have access to the realm of God's grace in my daily living. Church, I want you to hear me today. Grace is not just a word for the altar call. It's a word for every day. Grace is the whole realm of my experience in living in the mercies of God. Grace is living inside everything that God makes available to me. Everything that comes from his father heart of love. And I draw upon it by faith. That's why the Bible says to grow in grace. When the Holy Spirit said to grow in grace, he didn't mean for you to come up to an altar and get saved all over again every time that you come to a church. He means to grow in your experience of God's grace, of living in his grace more and more. The Bible says that God has delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness and he's brought us out. He's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of light. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, congratulations, your transfer went through. Amen. But Paul wants us to know here that being justified by faith, as wonderful as that is, is really just only walking through the door of grace. It's just the first step in experiencing the goodness of our God. We were justified by faith, and when we were, we came to know that we have an awesome, wonderful, heavenly Father. But we can't stop there. We need to go through that door and begin to walk into the palace of his kingdom because God is inviting us to explore that relationship and get to know him better and better and better. Church, I want you to see that God did more than just adopt you when he declared you righteous. He gave you a wonderful inheritance as well. And now that we are saved, Paul says that we have access by faith to all the riches of his loving kindness. The word of God tells us that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the Bible also tells us in Colossians 1 that God has qualified us. Everybody say that word, qualified. God has qualified us to share, listen, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So when you are justified by faith, that is only the beginning. When you're justified, all that does is qualify you to know what Christian living is really all about. 
Your salvation is designed to launch you into a new kind of life in which you know God and he knows you. In Acts chapter 6, we read about why Jesus sent Paul out to preach. Do you know what Jesus said about why he sent Paul to preach? He said, you can read it there. He said it was so that people could receive, listen, forgiveness and an inheritance. Hmm. Now think about this. Tomorrow morning, first thing in the morning, Monday morning, if a lawyer calls you up and says, hey, guess what? You just inherited $50 million. That is good news. Amen? Amen. All right. One of you, Pastor Glenn thinks so. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> you need more vision. Come on. With $50 million, you can buy yourself a mansion. You can pay for phase two. With $50 million, who knows? You might even be able to put a dent in your student loans. But knowing that you got an inheritance and even possessing that inheritance is not the same thing as enjoying that inheritance. You may legally possess it, but you are not necessarily walking in it. Paul says we have access by faith into this grace. We have a way into it. We have a way to lay a hold of it. We have a way to receive it. And by faith, Paul says, we can continue by faith to keep drawing on our inheritance. It's something we can keep learning about and something we can keep growing in forever. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that in the ages to come, God is going to continue to keep on showing us the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, it's going to take all of eternity and beyond for God to keep unfolding to us forever just how amazing grace really is. But you know what, church? I can start learning about it and I can start drawing on it now. The Bible says that Christ has been made my wisdom. It says I have the mind of Christ Today, the Bible says he's been made my strength now. It says that he is my peace. So many great and precious promises of the word that we need to know and learn and start to walk in and explore them and just enjoy them as they transform our lives. We need to learn by faith to live like a child of our royal father, accessing the riches of his grace. If you are content to merely be saved, I'm glad you're saved. <laughs> That's fantastic. You're a new creation, and I look forward to fellowshipping with you up there, calorie free. <laughs> but I want to learn all about the wonders of being a child of God. I have access by faith to his unmerited favor. King David said in Psalm 31, Lord, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you. Paul also says in verse 2 that part of that inheritance is that we can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have the hope of eternal life, a hope that we are going to share his glory. Being justified, being made part of his family, it means that now I have an assurance that I'm going to see him face to face. John the apostle said, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. This is real hope. It's not hope the way that we have come to use the word hope nowadays in the English language. You know, we have ruined a lovely and powerful word in our language by using it in the sense really of just wishing for something. I know that some of you right now are saying, for example, I hope the Yankees make the playoffs this year. But church, listen, that is not, that is not what Bible hope means at all. Bible hope is a confident, expectant, 
trust in something that's real, something that's solid. The Bible says that hope in Christ is my anchor. It keeps me anchored to his throne inside the veil, and it keeps me tethered securely to God, securely to his presence. And through Christ, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, being with him in glory, seeing his glory, sharing his glory. That's something powerful. It will keep me afloat and it will keep me going. Paul also says in verse three, we also glory in tribulations. And you know, church, nobody welcomes tribulations, of course. And yet the Christian can glory. He can boast about them because he has a hope in heaven and God has anchored him there. The Christian can boast about what God is bringing him through because we know that in all of our tribulations, there is a purpose. There's a loving father who's behind it all. And he's using all of these struggles that are tough sometimes to conform me into the likeness of his son. He's using my trials to build some proven character into me, to give me perseverance and give me a heart that's full of a real steadfast hope. We can be glad that he sent some of these things our way to make us strong. How many of you know that the world doesn't need any more Christian marshmallows? The world needs to meet some people of proven character who can radiate some real hope out into a dying world. That's the second great blessing that comes through Jesus' blood. We have access by faith into the grace of God, knowing him and growing in him every day. Three great blessings we have because we've been justified by Jesus' blood. And finally this one, because of his blood, we have been given the Holy Spirit. Because of his blood, we've been given the Spirit of God. Paul says in verse 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This is one of the greatest blessings of being justified, of being put into right standing with God. Next to receiving forgiveness itself, being given the gift of the Holy Spirit may be the greatest blessing that we experience in this life. Pastor Glenn and I have preached, of course, a number of times on the Holy Spirit and his ministries over the past few years, and it's not my purpose to review the doctrine of the Spirit right now. I don't want to get ahead of us because I'm sure we'll have time later on for a deeper look at what the Spirit does. There are so many things that he does for us, and Paul shares quite a number of them with us as we move forward deeper into the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 8, Paul is going to reference the Spirit's work a dozen or more different times. But here in chapter 5, he's giving us just a little peek at just one thing the Spirit does for the people of God, and yet it's tremendously powerful. In chapter 5, Paul is emphasizing just one facet of the Spirit's ministry. Paul's focus, listen, you have to get this, Paul's focus is how the Spirit helps us to experience our living hope. How? By helping us to know and understand the love of God. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit helps us to experience that living hope. How? By helping us to know and understand the love of God. In verse 5, Paul says, The Holy Spirit who was given to us has poured the love of God out into our hearts. Paul is convinced that every Christian is enjoying that experience, or at least certainly that they can experience that. Then he says something that requires me to put on my thinking cap. Paul says that hope will not disappoint us. Or some of the older Bible versions say hope will not make us to be ashamed because God's love has been poured out in our hearts by the Spirit. What does that mean and how does it work? May the Lord help us to grasp this simple truth today and it's this. Knowing that God loves me is what helps me to hold on to him. Let me say that again. You have to get this in your spirit. Knowing that God loves me is what helps me to hold on to him. Praise God. Paul says further down in Romans 5, and we talked about it a little bit, that God loved us even when we were enemies. 
And many times in the book of Romans, Paul makes his case by making a type of argument that we call an a fortiori argument. Now, before we leave today, we're going to study just a little bit of logic. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, buckle up and get ready. All right, if the belt is too tight on you, just, you know, pull on it, loosen up the slack a little bit. What is an a fortiori argument? Well, this is a Latin phrase, and basically this means that if one thing is true, then logically something else must also be true for a stronger reason. Paul makes a number of such arguments in Romans, and after today, like any good Bible scholar, you'll be able to spot them. These are what we might call the how much more arguments. This is the type of argument where you reason like this. If this thing is true, how much more must this other thing be true? And we all recognize the logic in that kind of argument. In ancient times, Greeks and Jews used it. And the Bible actually has many examples of this kind of argumentation to convince and encourage people. Jesus used this kind of argument when he said, if you, being evil, I'm, I'm not directing that to this side of the room, just <laughs> humanity in general. If you, being evil, Jesus said, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And Paul says here in Romans 5, if God loved you when you were a sinner, how much more will he save you from wrath now? Then he asks us, if the dying Christ saved you, how much more will the risen Christ do for you? Praise God. Worship team, you can come back, please, if you would. Now, you feel that encouragement. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted you to feel when he said that in Romans 5. That's why he said it. And Paul says the hope that you have in him, the trust that you have in him will never disappoint you. Why? Because we know his love. We've learned about his love and we've experienced his love, knowing about his love, sensing his love, being convinced of his love. All of that increases my hope and it helps me to hang on. The Holy Spirit is always ministering the love of God to our hearts. God gave you the Holy Spirit so that when you doubt, and some days you might have a doubt that you're really going to make it, when you think you're ready to give up, the Spirit begins to cry out on the inside of you saying, no, don't give up. Think about how much God loves you. If he saved you when you were his enemy, how much more will he save you now that you've become his child? Some of you might have come into this church a little bit discouraged this morning. And yet the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart out of Romans 5 today, saying, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved through His life. What wonderful blessings are ours, church, because we've been justified by faith in Jesus' blood. Paul says in verse 11, not only that, not only all these things he's already said, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We've been reconciled to the Father, and that's a reason to rejoice. That's a beautiful word, isn't it, reconciliation? In the Greek language, that describes our condition now that we've been justified by faith. And do you know how they use that word in New Testament times? That word was used to talk about a situation where somebody was out of favor with the king, and then they were restored back into favor with the king. And that's you and I. Have you been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? If the answer to that question is no, or if the answer to that question is, I'm not sure, you can be sure today.
You can be justified. You can be made right with God freely, the Bible says, through the grace. That means through the kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we trust on him for our salvation, we can experience all those wonderful blessings. Those are just a few of the countless blessings that come to us through the blood. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith to all the riches of his grace. And we've been given the presence of his blessed Holy Spirit. Praise God, church. Would you stand to your feet and let's give praise to Jesus Christ, the King, in his house this morning. Hallelujah.